there is very little consensus as to when science fiction began, with different writers often putting forward a wide ranging number of historical literary traditions which can go as far back as the Epic of Gilgamesh, Plato's Republic, and the works of Lucian of Samosata in the 2nd century ACE. Some academics and critics see science fiction origins as beginning during the Renaissance, while others prefer a more recent approach, seeing it as a form of literature that really began with the advent of the Industrial Revolution. Finally, there is a school of thought that views science fiction as purely a product of the 20th century, beginning when the term science fiction was first brought to the popular consciousness by the magazine editor, publisher, and writer Hugo Gernsback in the late 1920s. Obviously, there is little agreement within the science fiction community as to when science fiction itself actually began. Some cite that it didn't start until the modern novel's conception in the 18th century, others viewing that the word science itself had not really been readily defined until around the same period, and indicates that such concepts cannot exist until they are defined. Most science fiction historians, regardless of these rather spurious discussions, still tend to look back to the same forms of literature which can be seen as creating the initial spark that would fan the later flames of science fiction, namely the body of literature which we refer to as proto-science fiction. One of the first examples put forward is the anonymous Epic of Gilgamesh, taken from a number of sources made up from various inscribed tablets from Nippur and Kish, as well as Hittite and Hurrian versions from Bogoskoi, all date to the first half of the second millennium BCE. The oldest fragmented parts of the Sumerian version of this tale date as far back as the third dynasty of Ur in the 21st and 20th centuries BCE. This was put forward as a candidate by Lester Del Rey in the 1970s, when he claimed that science fiction was as old as literature itself. Gilgamesh contains much that is fantastical in the tradition of the mythological epic, but apart from an Eden-like paradise within the text, there are no real elements of science fiction or indeed of proto-science fiction. As Darko Suvin points out in Metamorphoses of Science Fiction, there are a number of affinities between science fiction and mythology, but as he suggests in his discussion, fiction can be formally or morphologically analogous to myth, but it is not myth. In this same way, paradise-like places such as the Elysium Fields, the Happy Hunting Grounds or the Garden of Eden are not utopias, in the proper sense in that they are not extrapolated speculated, or based upon contemporary models of society, but rather are simply mythological or religious ideals of heavens on earth, or else representations of the afterlife. Although Plato's Republic is seen as being that work which has ultimately led to the development of utopian fiction, which is often seen as a subgenre of science fiction itself, it hardly represents a convincing case for a work of what we can call proto-science fiction. Proto-science fiction is not science fiction per se, but is rather a body of literature that either contains various elements which have become part and parcel of science fiction, or else represents particular ideals which have come to have had a profound influence on the genre itself. The first works that really fall into this broad category are by Lucian of Samosata, a Syrian born not long before 125 AD and died not long after 180. Although originally a rhetorician, Lucian became a prominent writer of satire, and it is two of his works in particular, A True History, Veriae Historia, or A True Story, and Icaromenopus, or The Sky Man, that are of interest to the science fiction reader and scholar alike. As examples of proto-science fiction, these two tales have the notable distinction of containing the first interplanetary journeys, Alien beings, or as they are sometimes better known in science fiction, the traditional bug-eyed monster, as well as featuring an interplanetary war. Brian Aldous goes as far as to discuss the omissions by translators of Lucian, who fail to mention the more vulgar aspects of his work, such as the lunar inhabitants' artificially constructed genitalia. As Aldous quotes here, this phallic ingenuity establishes Lucian's claim to be not only the first writer of interplanetary fiction, but the first writer to describe prosthetic limbs and cyborgs. Here is a key scene from A True History, 
where Lucian's travellers are carried to the moon by a whirlwind, which one should note, despite its antiquity, bears striking resemblance to the work of authors such as Edgar Rice Burroughs and Jules Verne. About noon, when the island was no longer in sight, a whirlwind suddenly arose, spun the boat about, raised her into the air about three hundred furlongs and did not let her down into the sea again. But while she was hung up aloft a wind struck her sails and drove her ahead with bellying canvas. For seven days and seven nights we sailed the air, and on the eighth day we saw a great country in it, resembling an island, bright and round and shining with a great light. Running in there and anchoring, we went ashore, and on investigating found that the land was inhabited and cultivated. By day nothing was in sight from the place, but as night came on we began to see many other islands hard by, some larger, some smaller, and they were like fire in colour. We also saw another country below, with cities in it and rivers and seas and forests and mountains. This we inferred to be our own world. We determined to go still further inland, but we met what they call the Vulture Dragoons, and were arrested. These are men riding on large vultures and using the birds for horses. The vultures are large and for the most part have three heads. You can judge of their size from the fact that the mast of a large merchantman is not so long or so thick as the smallest of the quills they have. The vulture dragoons are commissioned to fly about the country and bring before the king any stranger they may find. So of course they arrested us and brought us before him. When he had looked us over and drawn his conclusions from our clothes he said, Then you are Greeks, are you, strangers? And when we assented, Well, how did you get here, with so much air to cross? We told him all, and he began and told us about himself. That he too was a human being, Endymion by name, who had once been ravished from our country in his sleep and on coming there had been made king of the land. He said his country was the moon that shines down on us. He urged us to take heart, however, and suspect no danger, for we should have everything that we required. And if I succeed, said he, in the war which I am now making on the people of the sun, you shall lead the happiest of lives with me. In fact, Lucian's A True History not only contains a notable first trip to the moon, but also includes interstellar travel, as Endymion summons his allies the flea archers from the Great Bear, or Ursa Major. In a sense this does not necessarily make Lucian a science fiction writer. Lucian was primarily a satirist, and his aim in telling a true history was in fact to present a very untrue story, his purpose in which was to ridicule the so-called historical writers of antiquity, in particular Herodotus and Homer. The Acaro Menippus also features a journey to the moon by Menippus, who having improved upon Daedalus' design, negates the use of feathers and wax, instead severing completely the wings of a vulture and an eagle. His flight to the moon to escape the drones of philosophers provides us with an inspired example of the use of the moon in science fiction, in that it allows the protagonist to look down upon his own world and provide comment or criticism upon it. Menippus is able to observe keenly with one eye through the aid of Empedocles, who informs him that because he has the use of one eagle's wing, he has the equivalent of the bird's sight in one eye. The voyage to the moon as a locus for the use of satire on humanity's current state is probably Lucian's most enduring influence on science fiction, and has been copied and paid homage to in almost every kind of fantastical journey throughout literary history. Many writers and critics exclude works such as Lucian's within the tradition of science fiction for one reason or another, which will be illustrated more clearly when I present some of the definitions of science fiction. Lucian is important to understanding the literary developments that led to science fiction. The tradition here is as real and as valid as any other, and Lucian's influence on this is enormous, to the point rightly or wrongly, that some call him the father of science fiction, which is no more or less correct 
than calling Herodotus the father of history. As an early example, there is no real reason that we cannot call a true history or a Caromenopus fine examples of proto-science fiction. As I have pointed out, not all writers and critics agree with the stance that science fiction has a long literary tradition. Kingsley Amos in his Christian Gauss lectures held at Princeton in 1959, and published as one of the first serious attempts to study the genre in New Maps of Hell, discusses the status of Lucian, but fails to see his work as any form of science fiction. The distinction of this, the so-called true history, is that it includes the first account of an interplanetary voyage that the researchers have managed to unearth. But it is hardly science fiction, since it deliberately piles extravagance upon extravagance for comic effect. Extravagance for comic effect is certainly not a reason for precluding Lucian from the debate, because numerous science fiction stories and utopias exist that are written in just such a manner. Douglas Adams' The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and Samuel Butler's Erewhon provide two such obvious examples. But Amos is prone to be dismissive of a number of early utopian works as well, seeing them as purely fantastical, until we come to Jonathan Swift's Travels into Several Remote Nations of the World in Four Parts by Lemuel Gulliver, also known as Gulliver's Travels, which he believes exists in a very different mode to these other utopian satires and is a definite ancestor to the works of science fiction. Amos's dismissal of these other early examples of proto-science fiction, or if we use his terminology, ancestors of science fiction, fundamentally rests on the fact that they are fantastical, certainly a term which we can apply to all of their works, but Swift would in this case be no exception. Swift's Gulliver's Travels to Amos stands out from these other works because of the pains taken by Swift to counterfeit verisimilitude in the details of his story. Swift's Gulliver's Travels to Amos stands out from these other works because of the pains taken by Swift to counterfeit verisimilitude in the details of his story, which as he sees it helps to provide a suspension of disbelief. The satiric utopias that Swift presents in Gulliver's Travels are seen by Amos as also representing the point where invention and social criticism meet, and the remarkable thing about the second of these two differences is that it can very obviously be applied to these other fantastical journeys and utopias. If we were to say that Lucian's A True History or Moore's Utopia were not filled with invention and social criticism, the obvious nature of how wrong this statement actually is becomes all too apparent. Brian Aldiss also dismisses Lucian's work as being science fiction in the same manner he dismisses the Epic of Gilgamesh, and although I think that the former is valid, I believe he is being a little unfair with Lucian. The texts are quite different altogether, and Lucian's medium of satire and extrapolation are key elements to the science fiction tradition, and must be viewed within the context of his times. Aldous himself puts forward the idea that science fiction begins with Frankenstein, and has no real ancestry in fantastical literature, and tends to be a stalwart defender of this theory. But his dismissal of the concepts of proto-science fiction having a long tradition back throughout history, fails to provide any real analysis of these texts, to the point where ironically enough he is being as dismissive and ridiculing to science fiction historians as Lucian was to the literary historians of his own time in antiquity. Although science fiction can no more be said to have begun with Lucian than spaceflight began in Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks, this tired old litany is still chanted in various sequestered parts of the globe. Indeed, dismissed by others, there is a fundamental relationship between the works of Lucian and those of, for example, Thomas Moore, Johannes Kepler, Francis Bacon, Voltaire, Jonathan Swift, Serrano de Bergerac, Jules Verne, and H. G. Wells, which is one of inspiration and reflection. Examples of this tradition are primarily in the utopian strand of proto-science fiction, and can also be seen as being carried on in the likes of Frank Herbert's Dune, which has a particularly strong structured historical reality, based on concepts derived from 
Samuel Butler's pastoral utopia, Erewhon. It is primarily Dargo Suvin who has provided one of the main arguments for seeing science fiction as part of a long historical tradition, in part through his definition of cognitive estrangement, which I shall discuss later. Suvin sees a very real tradition behind science fiction leading back to the works of Lucian. Suvin believed that science fiction was born out of two conflicting tendencies, those of a potential cognitive tendency and its opposing mystifying escapism. To Suvin, this convention is very real and obvious, and it's important in that science fiction does indeed have a tangible and identifiable tradition. Even more so, it shows the significance of Lucian to those who came after him. I think it is also worthwhile to point out Domna Pastormazzi's work on Hellenic science fiction, who I believe quite rightly points out that this literary tradition as seen by the likes of Amos, Aldous and others comes specifically from an Anglophone attitude. Pastor Mazzi recognises that such authors and critics find it all too easy to dismiss works such as Lucian's due to a separation of both language and culture from these texts by English-speaking writers in what is a genre dominated primarily by the English language. Aldous can easily dismiss any Lucian to Verne approach due to the linguistic and cultural remoteness of those illustrious English-speaking authors. He prefers to be indebted to Mary Shelley and to H.G. Wells rather than to a foreign culture so distant in time. Perhaps with the experiences and the sensibilities of the Greek mind, Aldous can only see an unbridgeable gap. Pastor Mazzi also in her article echoes the sentiments of David Pringle, who sees science fiction as a descendant of the Lucianic satire and the Menippean satire. The link with the traditional mythical is sometimes spurious, but Lucian's sharp and amusing satire is more than an attempt at a fantastical journey with the occasional witty observation. It is a work that has carried through time to influence many other writers who have dabbled in the realms of proto-science fiction, in particular the satirist utopian writers such as Moore, Swift and later Verne and Wells. It does so by providing a distinct social commentary on the nature of history, by fundamentally estranging his audience from a certain reality in order to provide a deliberate ridiculing of an established mode of thought, namely that of the literary historian. We must not lose sight of the fact that Lucian's work is not science fiction, but rather proto-science fiction. And as the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction 2nd edition points out, Lucian is vital to that somewhat problematic line of descent of prose fictions which leads eventually to what we might legitimately think of as science fiction proper. The tradition of Lucian ultimately leads us to Thomas Moore's Utopia, and in recognising this tradition, it is necessary to understand the resurgence of Lucian's works during the period in which Thomas Moore wrote his own utopian vision and its subsequent popularisation. In fact, Thomas Moore was part of that resurgence when in 1505 to 1506, along with his friend Erasmus, he translated a number of Lucian's works. A vast number of Greek and Roman texts had been lost to the Western world for many years, mainly through events such as the burning of the Library of Alexandria and the eventual downfall of the Roman Empire. As an influx of this work returned to the West from the Arabic world in the 15th and 16th centuries, at first through Italy and then later to other countries, it would eventually spread as far as Britain. The revival of Lucian began at the end of the 15th century. The Renaissance was fundamentally about the rediscovery and interpretation of the culture of the classical world, and again, some commentators have a tendency to see this period as the beginning of proto-science fiction due to works such as Moore's Utopia. To the humanists, this new wealth and the manifold uses made of it were what the Renaissance, in the older and restricted sense of that term, was about. The recovery, dissemination, study and cultural consequences of a large body of ancient writings, hitherto largely unknown, 
at first hand or little understood. Thomas More's Utopia is no doubt influenced by Plato's Republic in many ways, but there is also a definite influence by Lucian himself, as there is on other writers within the realms of proto-science fiction. Plato's Republic is very much his vision of the ideal polis or city-state, where there is justice and equality and a form of communal life with shared property. It was also brought about partly by Plato's disillusionment with the Athenian isonomian system following Socrates' refusal to accept ostracism, instead choosing to commit suicide. The concept in the Republic is very much a social experiment presented in the form of a Socratic dialogue where a number of attributes from various states were brought together to create an ideal polis. This concept in particular, combined with the fantastical journeys evident in Lucian's works, are the texts that most inform Moore's own vision of a utopia, which is in itself a pun on the Greek word utopia, which means good place. Moore's utopia however means no place, and it is probably this more than any other work that has influenced and set standards for utopian fiction and its many subsets, in that there is no such place as a perfect society, it in itself being a lofty and unreachable ideal. Within utopian fiction there are a vast array of subgenres and variations including uchronias, dystopias, cacotopias, utopias with an e, omnitopias, ecotopias and extropias just to name a few. Because of its concepts of shared property and communal life, classical utopias and socialist utopias are often presented as a justification for the application of Marxist theory to the study of science fiction, due to their similarities as critical theories, a trend carried forward by the likes of Darko Suvin and later Carl Friedman. The traditions of the fantastical journey carry forward all the way through to modern day science fiction, as does that of the utopia. Other examples of early fantastic journeys and utopias in the mode of Lucian include Francis Godwin's The Man in the Moon or A Discourse of a Voyage Thither by Domingo Gonzalez, which is another text that features a journey to the moon, this time when the eponymous hero arrives there by being pulled along by a flight of geese. Again, Godwin's text was of a particular influence on later works, especially on those such as Serrano de Bergerac, and the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction describes his work as perhaps the most influential work of proto-science fiction. Francis Bacon's The New Atlantis, published posthumously, features another journey to a utopia where we have a social system that is based on the family and where scientific investigation is of the utmost importance for the people there in order for them to better understand nature and hence conquer it. Although probably not as well known as some of the other historical utopias and fantastic journeys presented here, nonetheless it is a book which essentially presents a society that advocates scientific progress for the betterment of humanity. Jonathan Swift's Travels into Several Remote Nations of the World in Four Parts by Lemuel Gulliver, also known as Gulliver's Travels, is also a work seen as a form of proto-science fiction. And as Brian Aldous points out, in this continuing tradition, Swift knew his Lucian, as indeed did many of these writers. Three elements in particular align Swift's work to this category of fiction. The first, that it is a satire in the Lucianic vein, although Swift's particular style of satirising a satirist, as well as the biting nature of his comments presented in such a deadpan manner as in a modest proposal, has ultimately led to this kind of work being known as a Swiftian satire. The second of these elements is the series of four fantastical journeys to the realms of the Lilliputians, Brobdingnag, Laputia, and the land of the Hunims and Yahoos, represent either utopias or dystopias. Swift's purpose here was to place Lemuel Gulliver in four very different and estranged worlds, in order to present an amusing view on both British society and the nature of mankind. Finally, the land of Laputa in Book 3 of Gulliver's Travels is itself a flying island populated by one of the great conventions of science fiction, namely that of the mad scientist, 
Peter Nichols in his article on Swift in the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction 2nd edition comments on the fact that this is the first important appearance of the mad scientist in literature. Voltaire's Micromegas is another interesting story to look at within the context of proto-science fiction and is remarkable for the fact that it features an interplanetary journey where alien beings, namely two giants, visit the Earth from their respective homes of Saturn and a world which orbits the star Sirius. The giant from Sirius is called Micromegas, and after journeying to Saturn, forms a friendship with the secretary of the Academy of Saturn, whom he travels with to Earth. On arriving, they at first examine a wheel, thinking it to be the only intelligent life, until they discover a ship and its passengers, mainly philosophers returning from a voyage to the North Pole. They question the occupants of the ship and become amused to the point of hysterical laughter when they realise the prideful nature of the microscopic humans, who as one points out feels the universe was made entirely for their benefit. Before the two giants leave, they give the humans on the ship a copy of a book with the secrets of the universe contained therein. The book, when opened, turns out to be blank. One of the last notable works of proto-science fiction to appear before we come to Frankenstein was by the Dutch writer Willem Bilderdijk, whose A Short Account of a Remarkable Aerial Voyage and Discovery of a New Planet is again another tale of an interplanetary voyage, this time conducted in a balloon, and also seen by some as a candidate for one of the first science fiction novels. Here the hero travels to another world and conducts a scientific study of plants and animals before rescuing a stranded traveller and returning home. The dominance of the utopia and fantastical journey in proto-science fiction ends with a work that would present archetypes to the genre that would embed them in the literature to follow. With Swift having presented the idea of the mad scientist in Gulliver's Travels, Frankenstein in turn presents one of the first Edisonian type protagonists to be presented in science fiction, although the template to this can be seen as going much further back to the character of Daedalus who in Greek literature and mythology represents the first archetype of the scientist-inventor-hero. It is with Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley's Frankenstein, or a modern Prometheus, that the debate around science fiction heats up, with Brian Aldous putting forth his idea that this is the first bona fide work of science fiction. Although once again this has caused much debate, there are a number of critics and writers who see this work as a genuine starting place for science fiction. Again, the choice of a particular text generally complements how a science fiction writer or critic actually defines science fiction. And with Mr Aldous this is also true. Brian Aldous sees science fiction as being a genre that has emerged from the gothic fiction of the 19th century, and again I will look at his definition of science fiction later. To Aldous the main proponent of this argument, Frankenstein represents the first occasion in literature where the fantastical occurs in a sense, not through divine intervention or through some spurious use of magic, but through the use of science. As Odysseus declares man no longer needs the gods, so too does Victor Frankenstein show that man no longer needs superstition or magic, and as Aldous puts it, dramatises the differences between the old age and the new, between an age when things went by rote and one where everything was suddenly called into question. When asking what exactly is it about Frankenstein that makes it particularly innovative, and why we should hold it as the first genuine work of science fiction, Aldous has the following to say. Frankenstein is the Faustian dream of unlimited power, but Frankenstein makes no pact with the devil, the devil belongs to a relegated system of belief. Frankenstein's ambitions bear fruit only when he throws away his old reference books from a pre-scientific age and gets down to some research in the laboratory. Frankenstein's creation is often commented upon as being golem-like in the Jewish and biblical tradition, but as Aldous points out, the life that is created in the monster is not the product of supernatural force. Science has taken charge, as he puts it, and the birth of a new scientific understanding is what emerges with this new creation. Ultimately, Aldous sees Shelley as a forerunner to the likes of Verne and Wells, and the science fiction writers who came after, 
because in combining social criticism with new scientific ideas, Mary Shelley anticipates the methods of H.G. Wells are of many who have followed in Wells' footsteps. In dismissing the previous works in the traditions of science fiction, all this, I believe, is looking at Frankenstein as one of the first works that attempts what is known as a hard science fiction approach, the term referring to stories which are more orientated towards science rather than the opposing soft science fiction, which tends to be more angled at social concerns. Frankenstein is to be fair a combination of both, and it is interesting that Aldous actually acknowledges this, and I believe he is ultimately dismissive of previous works because of the context of scientific knowledge relative to the time in which any given author was active prior to this point. Because we have electricity and resuscitation and many technologies derived from the period following the Industrial Revolution, it is easy to say that Shelley's work is science fiction more so than the others. Perhaps because some technological or scientific ideas may have been found wanting from previous times. This, however, does not make them any less valid to the temporal locations of previous writers of science fiction.